Welcome to a show about learning technologies so powerful they transcend the boundaries of reality itself. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to New School VR. This is Pinky Gonzalez, and with us today is Suzanne Krause, or Kraus, if you're a a United States listener and uh, have a hard time with the pronunciation. Uh, Suzanne is with us from a company called DelightX, and we're going to talk about a product called CoSpaces. Welcome to the show, Suzanne. Thanks so much for inviting me. You're, uh, You're in Munich, Germany today. Is that right? Yes, I am. What's what I love about this is that we're actually back to our regularly scheduled recording time here in Portland, Oregon, which is usually uh, in the in the morning hours in on uh, Fridays. The last couple of shows have been recorded in the afternoons here. Today we're doing both. It's it's uh it's just just after six p.m. your time there. Is that right? Yeah, it's ten past six. Ten past six. Well, thank you for staying late at work just for us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> actually, it's a holiday here, so I'm at home on my sofa. <laughs> ah. I don't know if that's better or worse. <laughs> Thank you for taking time away from your holiday for us. No uh, worries. So the Delightx, the company, has a, a bit of a storied history. Before we get into the role of VR and what you guys are doing in classrooms and beyond, tell us a little bit about the background of the company itself. Uh, so uh, Delightx started back in 2012. Uh, it was founded by Eugene Beliav, who's also uh, a co-founder of JetBrains. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do software for developers. And um, Delightex started off with a software called Coaching Spaces. Uh, you see, we're very creative when it comes to naming our <laughs> software. <laughs> and that was a platform, or it still is, it actually still exists, it's available. It's a platform for coaches to meet online with their clients and have remote coaching sessions that um, also have a 3D space in which you can interact. Uh So uh, it's basically a bit like Skype where you can call someone, you can see someone, you can talk to the person, but at the same time, you have a virtual three-dimensional space that you can interact with. You can place objects in there. Um, For example, you can place figures that represent yourself or someone else. You can do something like a family constellation, uh, for example, and thereby have a remote coaching session where you also have some kind of space. So coaching spaces versus co-spaces, what what are the difference between those two products? Um, So basically co-spaces in some way evolved from coaching spaces. Um, So there is Uh, similar technology involved and also one thing that they really share is that they are a 3D software that uh, was made for people who are not super experienced with uh, with computers with technology so they are both very easy to use and in both you have this three-dimensional space where you can put up objects you can drag and drop them just from a library you can adapt them Um, and you can build something three-dimensionally very easily. Uh, With coaching spaces, the focus is much more on the collaboration, on the interaction. So you come to the space together with someone else. You can even go there with several people. You have a a video call, so there's much more interaction. And this 3D space is just one part that gives you a different possibility to interact. Got it. And these can be viewed on both a uh, laptop or desktop computer as well as in a virtual headset. Is that right? Uh, coaching space is n- not. So this is actually how we got to co-spaces. We started experimenting with coaching spaces and virtual reality. So we actually made coaching spaces work in a virtual reality headset. But then we saw that this is much more than an addition to coaching spaces. This is a VR creation platform. Mm -hmm. And this is the point where we took it and started to develop co-spaces, which is much more on creation. Um, Not that much on collaboration yet. We're going to increase that later. 
Um, but with co-spaces, um, the focus lies a lot more on creation, on creativity, creating something three-dimensional, and also being able to experience that in VR really easily. Outstanding. And and you guys have already made uh, some big waves in, in the ed tech and uh, more academic side of um, the VR space. Um, I'm, I have a, a number of questions I'm anxious to ask you about how you've actually uh, brought the product to market and, and uh, where, it, where it's all headed. Um, but to, to describe CoSpaces itself as a, as a baseline functionality, how does this work? Where, where does somebody get started and what, what should they expect to experience uh, right out of the gate? So what Coastal Space, uh, Coastbases basically is, is a platform that makes VR creation very easy and very accessible. So um, you have on the one hand a browser application with which you can build virtual reality content and you have a smartphone app with which you can view the content that you've built. Uh, so you just go uh, to our website in the browser so the creation software in the browser works without any installation. So this uh, one one part of it being really easily accessible. And inside this creation software in the browser, you can build just by dragging and dropping. You have a library of objects, but you can also add images, even your own images. You can add background sound. And all of this is really easy. Already kids can build something with it. And they actually really like it. And the next step is after you've built something, you can log into your smartphone app and access the project you have built from there. Actually, the browser app and the smartphone app uh, sync instantly. So everything you build is already in the smartphone app. And from there, you can use mobile VR. You can just switch on the VR mode, put your smartphone into a headset, and then you can experience your own creation in VR. So the only thing you actually need is a cardboard headset. I think that this really is one of the most brilliant executions of uh, how to get non-technical and non, non-design centric people into a VR creation space and particularly in this case a, um, an educational environment. Uh, was that was there a breakthrough? At what point did you guys realize it was possible to create something through a browser and then put on uh, a cardboard-like headset? Well, we had started experimenting with um, coaching spaces and VR already that we were using the Oculus Rift back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, we we did our pivot around um, the beginning of 2015. 16, so last year, uh, when the yeah the, when there was the VR boom, when you saw okay now VR gets really easily accessible for normal people <laughs> because everyone has a smartphone, and this was the point when we saw okay if if now everyone can experience VR without needing uh, a lot of complicated equipment, then it's the time for for people to also have a software with which they can really easily create something. Yeah, and, and easy it is. It, it's, it's a really neat uh, environment. Um, walk us through the process, uh, or give, give us a use case, or maybe an example of a, a, a teacher that's using this, or has used this, uh, this application at this point. And what's, what's the experience like? You would first go to the website and sign up. So you just create an account. And with your account, you can start building. So everything you build will be saved in your account in the browser app. Um, to take a simple example, uh, I know of several teachers who used co-spaces for vocabulary learning. So they build virtual vocabulary spaces with their students. Um, and then the student would just log in, start a new project, which would basically be just an empty stage, an, an empty space. Then they can choose a background with the exhibition. They would probably build some walls or put some blocks where you can hang something. And then, for example, they could choose images and hang the images onto the walls and add a little text block where they write something. So, for example, there have been uh, students who did Spanish vocabulary exhibitions. So they would put, for example, a picture of something and then add the the word in Spanish that describes it. Or they would build 
a little um, a little room and then name the objects in there. And once they're done with that, um, they would go to their smartphone, download the, the Cospaces app for the smartphone, log in with the same account that they used for building, and then they will see all their projects and then they can just open the project they built, switch on the VR mode and put the phone into their headset. I think this is the coolest thing. Uh, for those who are who have the luxury of listening to the show on a, uh, a, a mobile connected device and are not driving, uh, the website address <laughs> is cospaces.io. And there's some brilliant um, video and, and uh, motion graphics that illustrate some of what's going on. Um, on the homepage there, uh, to add a little bit of color to the kinds of environments that are created, you might be outdoors where there's grass and hills and mountains. You might be uh, indoors, as Suzanne is mentioning, um, inside looking at objects you might find in a home or a school classroom or, or otherwise. And when you create a space like this, you're pulling images one at a time out of a library and then placing them in that space. Um, Unlike some VR experiences, this this is really more about cr setting up a physical space in order to have a conversation or to give a demonstration as opposed to more of an interactive game style um, challenge based metric. Is that right? Yes and no. So uh, you can easily build those static environments and this is what we started off with. Um, but we have also introduced an early access program for scripting, uh, first only with JavaScript, but just this week we have also introduced Blockly. I'm not sure if you know, it is a very easy scripting language that works a bit like Lego. You take blocks that are stand for some command or function and you put them together and then you can write code pretty easily. Um, and with these functions, you can also make the spaces more interactive, or you can even uh, program little games with that. So we have uh, already uh, tried some games. So this is the next step for us to also make it more interactive and to make it possible to even make small games with Ghost Spaces. This is a really exciting development. Um, in our very first episode of New School VR with, uh, with Sean Daly, as our guest, uh, we talked a little bit about Scratch and Scratch Junior, which, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, is, is very similar in functionality. Yes, it is. Um, it, it, what's so neat about it for, for kids or really anybody who's uh, a complete novice uh, that wants to get into programming, the, the most important first step is to understand the basic mechanics. How, how, what is the logic that's involved as we stack these different functions together in order to create uh, the, the desired result. So if we want a character to go from point A to point B, um, it's with, before we worry about the language of programming or which, um, which syntax is required, just understanding the mechanics, you know, the character starts here and he ends there and it takes four steps to get in between. Um, so it's a neat way to, to learn and, and use these concepts without having to know the code as a first step. When do you guys uh, imagine this being released more more broadly? Actually, we don't have a timeline for that yet. So it's uh, accessible to any user. You can unlock the early access uh, yourself in your user menu. So you can just go into your account and you can uh, click on the little icon that uh, symbolizes your, your profile. Um, and there you can unlock the early access for yourself. So basically at the moment, everyone who wants to test it can test it. So I'm really curious. I'd, I've had a, a little bit of experience trying to sell, and uh, emphasis on the word trying to sell, <laughs> uh, software and, and uh, tools to schools and school districts. That can be a great challenge, to put it lightly. You guys really seem to have made some inroads in that space, um, and especially for a company based in Germany. Uh, I'm speaking of uh, schools in the United States. How has how have you done that? What has that process been like, and what sort of adoption and um, momentum do, are you guys seeing right now? So you we're talking about selling um, at the moment. We're still free. <laughs> Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Getting money is is uh, another challenge entirely. But uh, but people are using it. How, yes. how have people found out about it, and and uh, what's that that growth curve for you guys? What are you up to out there? Actually. Uh, at first, it wasn't that we went looking for the teachers, but it was the other way around. They found us. So in the beginning, it was not that we said, okay, we want to create a tool for teachers. We created a tool 
um, that makes it very easy to create VR. And, and we kind of just wanted to see who's interested in that. So we always had in mind that it would probably be interesting for kids and it might also be interesting for education. And then at some point we saw that there were a lot of signups from with, with similar email addresses and we realized, okay, it was a school. Um, and then we found out who it was. We, we contacted them and this was the, the initial point where we saw, okay, this is really interesting to schools. Um, and then we just started looking into that a bit more and I think most People found us when we uh, started getting active on Twitter because teachers who are into ad tech are pretty active on Twitter. So we started to be more active there. Uh, we also took part in um, AdCamp Global, which is an online event for teachers to learn about new tools, new things that they can do with technology in their classroom. Um, so this is how it got started. And and the nice thing is that those uh, ed, um, ed tech teachers or teachers interested uh, in, in education technology, they they like to spread the word. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know, I think it's uh, just as if they really like a tool, they, they like to share it. Well, they've done a good job. I, I see you guys on Twitter all the time. I, I spend quite a bit of time there myself just in, in researching and keeping an eye on what's going on in the space and, and co-spaces is a constant presence in that conversation. Yeah, it's really nice. We get a lot of love from Twitter. Uh, I'm, I, I do take care of the Twitter account and it's always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a neat thing. Well, so uh, for those interested in following these kinds of topics generally, what are some of the hashtags that you guys use that, that you seem to get some, um, some resonance with? Mm, so... An important hashtag is the hashtag ARVR in Edu. There's also a, a Twitter chat for that um, by James Donnelly, who's very active in the field uh, when it comes to AR and VR in education. They usually meet on Wednesday night for uh, for US time uh, under this tweet. So this, I think, is one of the most important ones. And um, and there's also VR at you, VR in at you. So I think that's the the most used ones. You, you, you're going to uh, spoil my secret a little bit, but Jamie is scheduled to be on the show here uh, in just a couple of weeks. Oh. So uh, we're going <laughs> to we're going to get deep into that uh, conversation too. I, I think of her as kind of a, a godmother of VR in the classroom. Yeah, you picked we'll, the right we'll person. She <laughs> 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 well, she's a riot too. She she definitely has a, a good sense of humor and. Uh, a handle on what's going on with technology. So that would be a, a, a neat conversation to have. Um, you're also a, an accomplished writer. You come from a journalistic background. And uh, one of my favorite articles that I've seen of yours is entitled VR and Education, What's Already Happening in the Classroom. Can you expand on that, that exact topic? What is happening with VR in the classroom today with or without co-spaces? So I think we are still in a very early stage with virtual reality in the classroom, but there are some teachers who are really passionate about the topic um, and they put a lot of effort into trying to find out what you can do with virtual reality. From what I see now, there's not so much uh, infrastructure for that yet. So from the teachers, from what um, I've heard from teachers that I have been talking to, they usually use cardboard headsets and often even their own phones or their students' phones. So <laughs> it's it's funny because they often have problems such as, okay, I'm, I'm using my phone. I hope that the kids won't do anything wrong with it or <laughs> uh, won't read my private messages. Uh, so um, it's something that I find funny because virtual reality in the classroom sounds so science fiction. But I think what's happening now is really, yeah, it's, it's this cardboard headset. It's improvised. Uh, they, they're still finding ways, but they're very creative what they do. And I think uh, it's a very exciting time, time for the new medium. So uh, what's, of course, very popular is um, virtual um, excursions. So like uh, Google Expeditions where you use virtual reality in order to take the kids and 
take them somewhere else. Um, so show them a different country, show them the moon. And I, I, I think that's that's great. It's one of the first exciting use cases you would think of for virtual reality. And there's teachers who say, well, th these kids, they grew up in a very small town and they never really left it. And now with virtual reality, we can take them to the other end of the world and it doesn't really cost anything. Um, so this is one thing that um, I think is already happening a lot. Um, then on the other hand, there's the, the creation part. So um, teachers do experiment with 360 images. I think this more often than 360 videos because there the equipment is a bit more expensive. But for example, there's a really nice uh, project from a teacher from the Isle of Man um, who used 360 photos um, in order to show what their island looks like to a school from Oman. Um, and then they, they, they sent these, these pictures to that school and they kind of exchanged uh, over a very long distance and, and, and showed some of their uh, country and, and culture. Um, so I, I thought this was a really nice project. And then, of course, with creation, um, this is also where we come in, where CoSpaces is used in order to make virtual exhibitions or in order to make literature come to life, experiment with programming, um, and all those creative ideas that teachers came up with and with which they were much better than we when we started <laughs> thinking about, okay, what could teachers do with that software? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, sort of the nature of technology and startups and, and just the, as the way innovation works, it seems, that you can come up with tools, but until people are using them and applying them to their specific circumstances, sometimes you don't even know how great something may or may not be. <laughs> yeah, I'm often impressed by the projects that they do. There's one teacher from South Africa um, who did a project where the students designed uh, eco cities of the future. So they paired up uh, three people and one was the researcher, one the architect and one the urban planner. And then they built this really vast uh, eco-friendly cities and put all these uh, funny and great ideas in there. Like there was a gym where the stationary bikes created electricity that was then used in the city. Um, and thinking that these these kids created their uh, utopia cities and then they could walk through them in VR, I think that's a really, really great project. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where, where do you think the... Uh, what are the differences in the learning outcome in these different modalities? A, a still image versus 360 video versus an immersive, uh, uh, maybe animated or illustrated environment. What's what's the best use case for each one of those things, in your opinion? Ooh, that's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also, I even think within virtual reality, uh, in in different use cases, it can have very different advantages. So from what I've heard from the teachers, one of the first things they say, if you ask them, why do you like VR, it's um, the engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so if you use a virtual reality headset, basically kids are much more engaged. It's, it's just more interesting. So I think this is one very easy easy advantage of VR that it just creates curiosity, it creates interest. Um, but I wouldn't say that virtual reality is always better. So I uh, I guess it depends uh, on how abstract the topic is, on how emotionally you actually want to get involved or should get involved. I think virtual reality really helps you to get emotionally involved in something. I'm not sure if you would like to try that when you start tackling the holocaust in school mm -hmm. for example yeah right. uh so i think this is one of the the things where we where you can decide which which medium works best so if, if, i think if you want to trigger empathy if you want to have the full range of feelings for the topic i think virtual reality is really good because it it immerses you so much 
it it sure does. I I think it's a that's a very wise perspective. And uh, <laughs> one one thing we in in the VR enthusiast world uh, tend to overstate is how um, what a game changing technology this is, and how much is possible. And you know, literally in infinite size and space and time can be uh, can be simulated and reproduced and isn't this going to be the classroom of the future I think it's also important to have this conversation around when it may not be the best uh, situation or just things to look out for aside from is it okay for your eyeballs <laughs> which we tend to hear most of when it comes to you know children using VR is it safe is there are there any physical concerns but I think the emotional concern is actually, that's a that's a heavy subject and a really important consideration, especially for uh, younger students and issues that could really uh, cause uh, trauma. Uh, there's things I really wouldn't want to see in virtual reality. Yes. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I was listening to uh, one of my favorite podcasts uh, called Research VR, and they had a storyteller on there who was just horrified at the idea of this the, these technologies being used to you know kill zombies or you know be be a witness to your own um you know murder <laughs> and some people you know in a gaming context those things you know can incite this sort of um ad adrenaline rush that some people are really looking for but um it causes that because it is so much more impactful emotionally and that that's that really does have some consequence in in uh real life scenarios especially so an, an interesting thing to, to contemplate uh have you seen any differences culturally or, or from one country to another in terms of how these technologies are being adopted or experimented with oh, that's an interesting question so we have seen code spaces being used in in different countries so we also have many users for example in in south korea we have users in singapore oh. um Funnily enough, I, I spoke to people who did a workshop in Singapore and uh, someone who did a workshop on Madeira, so an island outside of Portugal, and they actually mm. conducted a very similar workshop oh. um, where you can see the the history, for example, reflected or the, the topics that they deal with at school and in, in, in the projects that they do. But I'm not sure if I could really see something that really goes beyond that. Uh -huh. What what kind of uh, uh, activities are, are you working through in, in a workshop scenario? There has been, for example, uh, one, one workshop, I think they did several of that in, in Singapore, um, it was about storytelling. So the kids first wrote a story just with uh, pen and paper. And then they tried to create a setting for the story in virtual reality with co-spaces. And once they were done with that, they read out their story and recorded that um, and put it in as an audio in co-space. So you can also upload audio files. And then the result was that they got their own story and they could walk through it. So they could walk through the setting that they had built for their story and at the same time listen to their voice telling the story. That is the coolest. <laughs> I think that's these sorts of, of hybrid experiences um, are really, I think, so, some of the most fun and interesting in these early days of VR exploration. Um, and in the show's uh, third uh, session, we had uh, a man by the name of Na uh, Nathaniel Andrini, and he comes from a, a teaching background and, and also puts on um, engagement workshops, the things that help uh, students better understand each other and then themselves through that experience. And it was similar. There, there, was a, um, th th there were elements of this that had nothing to do with role play or acting things out. It was just writing and observing and sort of putting these basic pieces together. And then uh, as the program went on or the workshop evolved, then you take those as building blocks and begin to incorporate them into other, uh, uh, other experiences, you might say, in, in a virtual context. Um, do you guys provide guidelines or best practices? Or if somebody is just coming in cold on this stuff and they're trying to figure out how do I start, aside from signing up on the website and, mm -hmm. and building a scene, philosophically 
how, what, what are some steps I can take if, if I'm just getting started down this path? Mm, so we give some ideas on our website for projects that you can do, especially for educators. So, for example, that you could uh, create a virtual exhibition and then we tell you uh, the steps how you would do that um, or how you could interpret literature with co-spaces. Um, but I think apart from that, the the best tip is to just try and play with it and <laughs> have fun. <laughs> I think it's very easy to use and um once you start playing and then you see it in virtual reality and then you can go back uh, and then change something about it. Um, this is something um, which was really nice to observe when we went to um, fairs or exhibition. For example, we went to the Maker Fair in Rome and there were a lot of kids with their parents. Um, and sometimes you could see kids and parents exploring it together. So one person would wear the headset and then watch in VR what the other person was building and then oh, say, ah, oh, okay, put, put something here or change this and make the elephant bigger. And then they could swap <laughs> places. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's a tool, but it's also a toy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, th there's so much enthusiasm uh, from kids around Minecraft. It's been such a phenomenon for the last several years now. And I think that some of the mechanics here are kind of similar, where you have an environment that you're going to create your own things in, or you're going to import and, and uh, place your own things in. And there's just something magnetic about that for, for kids, that they just get it and like it and become part of the creation of a space of their own. Yeah, that's, that's something that every child likes or, or dreams of to, to become part of a world that they made up. Because as a kid, you have a vast imagination you make up things you make up worlds and if you can really interact with them if you can become part of them that's pretty cool <laughs> that's that's pretty profound <laughs> <laughs> every child grows up uh wanting to to create the world that they live in that's really it's true maybe i just read too many books as a kid but <laughs> there were so many fantasy worlds that i wanted to become part of uh that's that's magnificent have, have you found there to be a, a specific or, or kind of an age range that is most receptive to this at this point maybe between let's say eight and 14 sometimes even younger kids if they're tech savvy but uh We've seen kids if they're a lot long, younger than eight. Sometimes they still have trouble with with the controls and uh, handling the mouse or the touchpad. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about that age range. Got it. And to be clear, this obviously can and is being used in classrooms. It can also be used theoretically by a parent as part of a story time or something like that, right? Yeah, it can. I, th I think this this really is one of the tools uh, again here in the the early days where. We're, you know, this last Christmas season, we saw um, the Samsung Gear VR advertised heavily on the, you know, Thanksgiving uh, football games and, and uh, throughout the, the major holiday programming. Um, people are beginning to become aware of what these things are, but most people still have not used it. And those that have used it and then want to become a part of the creative process or and then the education process being kind of an ultimate extension of that, there's just not that many things yet that a non-programmer programmer can get in and do. What I love about CoSpaces is this is one of those things. Um, so to take it back to sort of a base concept here, if you tell a, uh, a story to, to your kids at night or if you've made one up, this would be a really great tool to be able to mm -hmm. log into CoSpaces.io, um, create a virtual version of that, just a simple um, space, that, you know, that, that whether it's a field or a house or whatever. Um, create your objects around it, um, record a narrative if, if you want to, or if that's part of uh, the, what, what you want this thing to feel like, and then your kid can put on a headset and be in that space, and, and you can do all of that right this second. I think it's, it's a really incredible tool. Yeah, storytelling is really nice. I uh, translated um, a fairy tale, for example, and that was a lot of fun. So with CoSpaces, it's even possible to have um, different spaces inside a project so you can build the first scene and then if you're in vr and you look down you will find a little ground menu and then you can go from one scene to the next scene so you could 
for example, tell a fairy tale in five scenes. And in the first scene, um, you see, we also have Hansel and Gretel, for example, in the first scene, you see them before they are sent into the wood. And then in the third scene, you see them when they find the um, the gingerbread house in the woods, and you always have the narrative in the background. Got it. So this is kind of the use of chapters in a, in a VR story. Yeah, exactly. Line. You can use chapters. Okay. That, and that's, that's big. So, uh, so z- z- w- <laughs> all of these things are available now. Anybody can do it. What does this cost? What, what does it cost and how long does it take to create a, a scene the first time, do you think? Mm, okay. So how much it costs is very easy. It's free. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, I cannot promise you that everything is going to stay free forever. We will have to make a living, um, but we um, will keep the basic version free. So there's going to be a marketplace where you can buy additional assets and there's um, going to be a pro subscription with special features. Um, but right at the moment, everything is free and there's uh, a version that's going to stay free. Uh, how long? It takes to create your first scene that very much depends, I think, on how much of a perfectionist you are, (laughs) what you (laughs) imagine to build. Um, But we've we've seen that um, at various people come, they use it for the first time, and 10 minutes later, they've built their first scene. So so cool. It works like that, yeah. Neat. And on the website right now, are there uh, examples, like Hansel and Gretel you're you're referring to, are those uh, things anybody can just pop on and and see for the first time without creating something? Yes, we have a library. You um, don't even have to sign up in order to to look at the library. There you can see different examples that we have built. Um, And also, if you download the app, uh, even without having created an account, you can also uh, see examples from our gallery in virtual reality. Excellent. And as always, we will include all of these links on the NewSchoolVR.com website. Um, how can we get in touch with you, Suzanne? Um, if you, you can. Want such a thing to happen. <laughs> 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 Our millions um, of listeners may just overwhelm you with email. Pretty much any social media <laughs> channel uh, will reach. That is great. Uh, is there anything that, that we, as, as a show or, or as a community uh, supportive of VR and education, can do for you and or for for co-spaces how, how can we can, how can we help get the word out there the best first step is start building something with co-spaces share what you've built with co-spaces give us feedback and tell us what we can do better and if you think we're already doing great then tell it to all your friends <laughs> <laughs> i love it. especially on twitter hashtag edtech <laughs> <laughs> That's good. How, how about, you can uh, also add the hashtag CoSpaces to anything you tweet on Twitter. There you that, go. Hashtag CoSpaces. All right. Well, you, you know we'll be doing that for uh, promotions for, for this this episode and, and those to come. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time today, Suzanne. This is just the neatest thing and I think a, an incredibly valuable tool, especially at the the price point. <laughs> for <goodness sake. laughs> Tough to well, it's not much of a compliment. <laughs> I said especially. <laughs> no, it's this is. I mean, you're, you really, in many ways, are are doing an extraordinary service for the world, for for teachers, for parents, uh, for just VR enthusiasts that are interested in creating things of their own and getting started. Um, this is this is a wonderfully accessible, uh, highly functional tool to to do that, and the this is exactly the kind of thing that we need people to to get their hands on if if we expect. The medium to continue to evolve and and uh, change lives now you're making me blush <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much uh links will be posted online is there is there anything else we haven't covered or that you want to make sure we we let people know about just also try the um the scripting early access try out blockly even if you don't know how to script because it's a lot of fun i have started uh, writing code with Blockly now. So even if you don't have any clue about scripting, that's a really nice thing to start with. I love it. My, my uh, daughter likes to make little characters dance. So I'm going to do a little scene where her, her and her friends get to dance around, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your holiday. Thank you again so much. And uh, we'll see you on, on Twitter and beyond. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. New School VR is graciously supported by and recorded live at Concordia University in beautiful Portland, Oregon. For over 100 years, Concordia has been preparing teachers and learning professionals for life 
and for a living. For more information, visit cu-portland.edu. And by dot dot dash, an experiential design and technology studio specializing in custom virtual reality and experiential marketing activations that incite wonder and inspire action. See more at dot dot dash dot io. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or through your favorite podcast delivery app. Visit us online at newschoolvr.com. And thanks for listening. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. This VR podcast is dope.